from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy in the studios of WPSU on the campus of Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam, and this is Democracy Works. Chris, we have two guests with us today. Right. Uh, both uh, Penn State uh, faculty members. Crystal Sanders is Associate Professor of History and Director of the Africana Research Center. And Erica Frankenberg is Associate Professor of Education and Demography and Director of the Center on Education and Civil Rights. Right. Uh, We've got both of them today because uh, they're co-hosting a conference on campus called Brown at 65, uh, which celebrates and takes a critical look at the... uh, at the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954. Right, right. Uh, a big one that most people who have gone to high school in the United States of America have heard of. Well, it's a critical one in American politics. Absolutely. I mean, it's, no uh, it, it, it follows from the 14th Amendment and then also from uh, a, an infamous segregation case called Plessy versus Fer- Ferguson in uh, 1896. And uh, so, yeah, just to give a very quick history of this, of course, the 14th Amendment was one of uh, several amendments passed after the Civil War Mm -hmm. uh, to give uh, African-Americans full citizenship rights and also for the first time, really, to introduce into the Constitution the notion of equality. Right. uh, Because a guaranteed due process. One person, one vote. This, this was really a key decision in American politics and uh, shape politics for quite a long time, uh, especially in the South, uh, because Plessy, vers- Plessy, which had to do with a, a Louisiana law concerning uh, the segregation of uh, train cars, uh, essentially ruled that separate is OK so long as facilities are equal. Mm-hmm. And so it established a notion of what was called separate but equal. Right. Uh, and separate but equal allowed Jim Crow laws, which were essentially the segregation of races throughout the South, including the segregation of schools, uh, to persist for many, many years. Uh, but in many ways, Plessy also had the uh, fruits or the uh, roots of its own uh, of its own end, of its own demise uh, within its decision. Because the idea that that was equal was always, almost invariably, a fiction. Right. right. Well, at least it offered offered opponents, and in particular the uh, NAACP, Mm -hmm. uh, a legal strategy. Mm -hmm. And the legal strategy was to show that separate is not equal. Right. Inherently. It was inherently not right. equal. And they did this in a variety of cases. They looked around the country for it. You know, you have to remember, 1954, African-Americans had little political power. Right. Uh, so they're active in the streets protesting civil rights, but they're also active in the courts. And uh, the NAACP legal strategy at this time was to find cases where they could challenge this notion of separate but equal. This big uh, case having to do with Texas law schools that does that. Right. Uh, then, of course, though, it's Brown. Which essentially mm-hmm. o- overturns this, but but I think it's interesting, and you're right that that uh, the NAACP um, knew where they wanted to get to in terms of desegregating schools, but they knew that that in order to make that possible, they had to start with some cases that were less direct, but set the table for but, that. Right? No, no differently than other uh, activist organizations design legal strategies sure. when they want to overturn mm-hmm. a, a certain kind of precedent, yeah, uh, but... is that you usually look at it in a series of cases mm-hmm. rather than necessarily one, one big case. Uh, but the reason Brown was important, and also because the, re- the reason that Brown was so controversial, is that it it... it it argued essentially that separate is not equal, mm-hmm. and it relied on a good, basically cannot be cannot equal. be equal, and it and it it relied on a good deal of social science research to make that case. Mm-hmm. Part of the significance of Brown, and I'm sure our guests will talk about it, because uh, Crystal in particular is a uh, uh, well, Crystal's a historian who studied the uh, studied the studied the South, and uh, Erica is an expert in school segregation and and, and, and policy with and, respect and, to education and public yeah. policy, mm-hmm. and, and I'm sure they'll talk about how even though this law passed. Pretty much nothing happened. The ruling said desegregation will happen with all deliberate speed. Right. And, and it, it became painfully ironic because nothing of the sort happened. Right. And it also pointed out a you know, weakness of the courts. And that is that just because the courts say something's going to happen, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. The courts rely on other branches of government to put their rulings into effect. So they needed Eisenhower to uh, use the federal troops to force school districts right. to have their schools or, you know, Congress to pass like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which created all kinds of oversight of uh, schools that would federal force government the oversight. federal yeah. government mm-hmm. oversight. Yeah. 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 So anyway, let's bring in the experts. Yeah. that um, And set the table for not just the history, but also where we are now. 
This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Erica Frankenberg and Crystal Sanders. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Uh, so we're talking today all about um, school segregation and the Brown v. Board of Education decision. Before we get into kind of the current state of affairs, I, I wanted to go back and uh, talk a little bit about the the years and kind of the time leading up to the decision in 54. We, we talk a lot on this show about social movements, kind of bottom up. Um, you know, civil rights and and some of the the movements that have happened abroad and and in reading about the case going back through the um, decision, it seems like this was maybe more top down as opposed to to bottom up. Or at least that's that's how it's portrayed. Um, I'm curious uh, from from your perspective, you know, what was the kind of social climate like, uh, social movements leading up to to the decision. Well, thank you so much for having us, Jenna. I think it's an exciting time to talk about Brown, given that next month will be the 65th anniversary of this historic decision that declared um, segregation in public schools unconstitutional. While we could think of this as a top-down decision in the sense that justices unanimously struck down segregation in public education, there were many people on the ground, black teachers, black principals, black parents, who had been organizing for generations for quality educational opportunities for their students. So we can't forget them as we remember this milestone, right? 1954 is a watershed year, but years, decades prior to 1954, black parents were mobilizing to ensure that their students had the the resources they needed, the textbooks they needed, to ensure that their students had transportation to get to school. So we can't leave them out of this equation. The other point I'd just make is that there's a lot of writing about the importance of social movements and trying to lay the groundwork for Brown, and that, in fact, white elite public opinion had shifted in recent years, and that was really important because there had been many cases, of course, that said that Plessy did not need to be overturned, and it was that that shift after the Cold War had begun that suddenly this didn't really comport with our ideals abroad, and so... Um, having a chief justice who was a former politician, in fact, the governor of California who had interred Japanese during World War II, I think, made him really attentive to thinking about the what the court's decision would say and, and making sure, as, as Crystal mentioned, that it would be a unanimous decision. Crystal, as you mentioned, we are 65 years from from the uh, decision in, in 54. So as we, we think about that time that, that has elapsed since then, did the the vision of what the, the courts and others were, were hoping to achieve in Brown ever ever come to fruition in, in those intervening years? Well, we need to think of, first about the initial responses to the decision. And there was massive resistance across the United States, not just in the South. I think of Dwight Eisenhower in 1957, when he sends troops to Little Rock, he essentially says, I'm doing this because the rest of the world is watching and laughing at us. He did not agree with the decision. He regretted appointing Earl Warren to the court. And so when we have that type of resistance from our highest political leader, what can we expect on the ground? And so we see massive resistance. We see white parents taking their kids out of public schools. We see entire um, school systems shutting down, as was the case in Prince Edward County, Virginia. We see very slow efforts to actually comply with the law. So when we think about Brown 1954, we don't see mandatory widespread desegregation in the South until the 1969-1970 academic year. So between that interim of 54 to 69, we see um, freedom of choice plans that were really token desegregation plans, ways to evade the court order. We see black parents consistently going into court, wanting enforcement of the Brown decision. We see um, school systems dragging their feet. We see Congress, people like Adam Clayton Powell, trying to use federal dollars as a way to move the needle toward desegregation. Um, You know, I call it the Powell Amendment, right? Suggesting that schools that receive federal funds could not continue to practice desegregation. And so this is, it takes a very long time before we even began to see real implementation of the court order. So we do begin to see it by the early 1970s. Yet today in 2019, we find ourselves really in a situation where our schools are beginning to look not much different than they did in 1960 we see widespread resegregation across the country. Yeah, and and uh, what are some of the factors that are, are leading to that, that resegregation? Well, 
One of the things that most people might not be aware of, but that more than I believe 25 states allow, is for communities to succeed from a school system and create their own new school system. And so across the country, but especially in wealthy suburbs and southern states, we see wealthy white communities pull out from school systems and create their own new school system that allows them to maintain racial segregation. We've also seen white flight. We've seen large numbers of segregationist academies that um, you know, came into existence in the wake of Brown continue to be these very strong and successful institutions in the 21st century. There are many ways in which um, white parents have been able to really not just avoid, but flee from public school systems across the country. Right. And and, and when you say, uh, you know, white families are, are creating their, their own school systems, do you mean charter schools or do you mean actually public schools? I mean public schools. So, yes, we do see charter schools rising up and creating problems in terms of allowing for diverse classrooms. But these are, are parents and, and communities that are creating school systems. It is actually legal. So... Um, I've studied the issue of school district secession. I think in the South, there have been several dozen that have happened since 2000 alone. Uh, Alabama, a state that I've studied, has one of the most permissive school district secession laws in which you, as long as you're a town of 5,000, you can vote to leave a countywide district. And why this is so important, just to underline a point that Crystal was making, is the South has been the most integrated region of the country in terms of desegregation in schools since 1970. And there are a couple of factors. One is importance of court order desegregation that applied to virtually every district in the South. But the second is the predominance of larger countywide districts. And so why that matters is in contrast to like the Northeast or the Midwest that has uh, you know, dozens if not hundreds of school districts in the same metropolitan area, uh, a countywide district can encompass both the city and the the suburbs within one one district, and that allows you to assign students across um, those lines of difference. Whereas you can't do that when there are district boundary lines in the way. In the well, you can, but people don't do it um, in, in the Northeast or Midwest. And so um, the fragmentation is really going to limit this demographic advantage that the South has had by creating these pockets of of new school districts that will make the South resemble areas of like the Northeast, for example. What was going on in the North and, and in other parts of the country at the time, even though there was not maybe uh, legalized segregation, but I'm sure it yeah. you know, was, was still going on? Yeah, I, I think that this is a really important question to ask. Uh, and both Crystal and I are natives of the South, so uh, I think it, it's important to think about how school desegregation looked different in the South versus the North. And of course, there is a really important historical difference in the segregation laws that did exist before Brown in 17 states in the District of Columbia. However, in Northern states, there were a lot of ways in which um, structures were used to create segregated schools as well. There was this intervening period of time, the first two decades after the Brown decision, in which there were a lot of questions legally as to how Brown would apply outside of the South. And so, you know, I've studied some of those decisions trying to look at judges who are really wrestling with what is de facto, what is de jure, what needs to be remedied. And they weren't Sorry, getting... Um, can, you, can you explain what those two terms sure, are? Sure, sure. De jure is um, segregation by law. So you can think of a state that had a law saying black and white children cannot go to the same school. That's sort of the most crystal clear um, version of it versus de facto is segregation that uh, happens in fact. So this is using neighborhood schools. So say you will go to the school closest to you when you're relying on the fact that, oh, by the way, those neighborhoods are segregated in part because of governmental policies. Mm -hmm. So um, that was quite common in the North. It was a tool that was being used in the South, but eventually the Supreme Court said in districts that had formerly been segregated, that was unconstitutional, that didn't go far enough, but never applied that outside of the South. And so then by 1974, the Supreme Court had really started to more officially close the door on de facto segregation, which really limited efforts in the Northeast, the Midwest, other regions of the country. But between 54 and 74, there was really a question around both because of Brown, but also because of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that Crystal alluded to that 
contain the Powell Amendment as Title VI, mm-hmm. uh, there were questions about can districts that are relying like on neighborhood schools or permissive transfer laws in the North, is that uh, something that they should have their funds cut off too, the way Southern districts were? And, and a lot of Southerners you know, rightfully got upset at Northern liberals who were passing civil rights laws that af- affected the South, but were constructed not to affect segregated patterns in the Northeast. One of the things that I feel like, Erica, you're alluding to is the connection between income and race. And when we think of resegregation today, whether we're talking about the North and the South, we have to look at housing patterns. We have to look at the lack of affordable housing and the ways in which we still have very weak fair housing laws. And that has been detrimental to ensuring that our public schools are as diverse and inclusive as they can and should be. In going back and looking at um, Justice Warren's opinion in in the Brown case, he specifically called out, um, you know, education's role as a public good and as an essential part of a healthy democratic society. So I'm just wondering if that same sentiment still exists today of of K-12 education as as a public good and as as a basis for, for healthy democracy, you know, where that stands today. If we can't think about public schools as helping all of our children and are just thinking, how is it going to help my children, we're going to approach our public schools and the kind of actions that we're okay with in very different ways. So secession becomes suddenly much more rational if you're worried about how am I going to get the relative advantage from my child or or children who look like my children. Or even thinking of it, how is it going to help my home value? Because, of course, home values, because of the geographic nature of school districts, are affected by the perceived quality of schools and then, of course, property tax funding. So so all of these are intricately related. But I think the way in which we've shifted from um, what I think is a really beautiful uh, rendition of the importance of public schools, and again, not not to increase achievement, right? He was talking about citizens in our democracy. I believe that most Americans still believe that public education is a public good. I don't believe that most Americans believe integration is a public good. So those are two separate things. The way we see parents of all races, of all classes, uh, mobilizing and advocating on behalf of their children lets us know that they, there's still some investment in public education, but there is no investment in integration as a public good. And so if we think about having diverse schools as a way to prepare our students to be productive citizens living in a diverse world, um, being a participant in a diverse workforce, that's where we can push back against these efforts against making integration a priority. So what do we know about how students perceive each other, kind of how they they perceive the, the world at large based on the type of school environment that they're in? Yeah, I think there's been a, a sort of a body of research that I sort of crystallize into two camps. One is um, the benefits of integrated schools for all students and that there are a range of social and psychological benefits. So you're less likely to have racial stereotypes, um, prejudice formation, particularly when it happens in the early grade. And of course, we're also assuming that uh, diverse schools are integrated within the schools as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there are really important benefits there. There are important benefits in terms of being more likely to live and work in diverse spaces as an adult. Some research even finds you're more likely to live in more integrated neighborhoods. So so really if, and this was part of the the strategy for for why you should attack K-12 school segregation in the 1950s was that it would, it's the key institution where, you know, most of our, our people are still a part of. And so if you get integration there, they f- are comfortable, they'll be then more likely to, to desegregate. So there are these perpetuating benefits of integration that is, I think are really important. Uh, and then the second are, you know, despite the heroic efforts, I think, of, of many communities, we have not historically ever given the same kind of resources to segregated minority schools. And I just want to kind of underscore two points that Erica raised. The first is that you talked about making sure that there's real desegregation within diverse schools. And that's important because it's not just making sure that black and white or Hispanic or Latina, Latino students are in the same school building, but making sure that they're actually in classes together. 
Unfortunately, we find that even in some diverse schools on paper, tracking has ensured that you still have all white classrooms and all black classrooms within what's quote unquote a diverse institution or a diverse school. So we have to make sure that when we talk about desegregation, we're not just ensuring that students are at the same institutions, but ensuring that students are not being tracked, ensuring that students are sitting in classrooms with people who don't look like them. Who, aren't, have the, who don't have the exact same experiences that they have. And the other thing, Erica, that you um, alluded to when you talked about historically segregated schools have, not, have been under-resourced. Even today, when we look at schools that are high poverty, high um, population of minority students, those tend to be the schools with the least experienced teachers. Mm -hmm. Those tend to be the schools that don't have advanced placement and IB programs. Those tend to be the schools that don't have the same extracurricular opportunities. So it's imperative, right? If we're going to ensure that every child, no matter where he or she lives, no matter where he or she's family is from, has access to a quality education and has the opportunity to reach his or her highest potential, we need to ensure that all of those students are attending um, diverse, integrated schools. Yeah, so these are all kind of really big societal, social kind of issues. So who needs to be at the table in order to, to move the, the needle on, on integration? And are there any models or, or any approaches that, that you've found in, in your research that have been particularly uh, useful? Yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is comprehensive in nature, and so it's going to require a comprehensive solution. And it's this even more important than it was at the time of Brown because we now have a majority students of color in our public schools. So there is, I think, an increased demographic urgency to why we have to get this right for our 21st century. Um, I think that we need to have educators and community members from all different backgrounds at the table. We need to have colleges of education at the table. Universities can play an important role. Um, politicians, you know, most of the desegregation now or integration is not like it was after Brown. It's not court ordered. It's not mandatorily busing people across town. It's voluntarily designed in nature. And so I think first you, again, have to think about framing this and, and how we talk about it as being good for all children and for our community. And I think there's a lot of of research to back that up. But then I think you have to think about what kind of strategies are you going to use both to get the schools diverse, but then also to make sure that the schools that are diverse are integrated within them. Um, one important part after Brown was ha making sure that you had a diverse faculty and staff because that reflects too uh, whether it was considered to be a black school or a white school. You know, there is really important reasons for both white students and students of color to have a diverse faculty. And so um, so, so, so then you need maybe teachers unions at the table. So it really takes uh, leadership articulating why this matters, even if it might mean that some parents will not get maybe what they initially considered to be the first choice for their, for their kid, that, that it's still in the best benefit for the entire community. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and are there uh, particular cities or particular communities that, that have been particularly successful at, at doing some of these things? Sure. I, I mean, I think no district is perfect. Um, but th there are a couple of communities that I think are, are really intriguing. So Jefferson County, Kentucky is where Louisville is. They had court-ordered desegregation in the 1970s. They merged the city and the county district. And uh, they were throwing like rocks at the bus, I think, initially. Uh, they were, their court order ended in 2000. The court said they had, had met the requirements under the changing Supreme Court law. And the district said, you know what, we, we have understood how vital this is. It's important educational goal, so we're going to voluntarily continue this. Um, their, and their, their, their policies were challenged. They went to the Supreme Court, and they were struck down in 2007 in uh, a decision that I think was a real setback for integration efforts. However, they went back to the drawing board. They revised their, their policy twice. And so um, today they use a, a really intriguing policy design. But even more than that, I'm, I'm 
impressed with the political will. They were challenged in state court after that, federal court. The state legislature has gone after them a bunch of times, and they they have maintained it. And it and it's been hard. And and they have had some parents who are upset that their child can't always go to the closest school. Um, but continuing to talk about why integration matters has been you know that so that's um, an example I always hold up. And as a North Carolinian, I must add the Wake County school system that's done a phenomenal job in ensuring that they have diverse schools across the district. Like Jefferson County, there used to be the Raleigh City Schools and then the Wake County School District. They merged in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and they created a a plan that that used race to um, ensure that all of the high schools in the district had um, basically equal levels or proportional levels of students of different populations. And I have to say, charter schools have been one of the reasons that we've seen widespread resegregation across the state of North Carolina. Until the mid-2000s, North Carolina had a cap on charter schools. I believe it was one per county. We have 100 counties. That meant we were not to have more than 100 charter schools. That cap was taken off by our state legislature a few years ago, and there has been an explosion of charter schools. We are seeing um, parents flee the traditional public schools in droves. And it's it's a nightmare. It's it's quite upsetting to see what had been you know such a crown jewel for our state, our public school system, to now be um, divided in this way. And we're seeing the the siphoning off of resources. Can I please leave us on a slightly hopeful note? <laughs> sure, because I please. do I do share Crystal's larger outlook. Um, one of the the things that a lot of integration advocates talk about is New York and how about five years ago, some of my colleagues wrote a report on the state of segregation in New York, and they said, New York is the most segregated state in the country. Well, um, New Yorkers didn't take that too well, right? Um, Shame can sometimes be a powerful motivating force. And and they have really, in that time, in in state government, really taken a lot of efforts to provide incentives for integration. Now, some of it's been for socioeconomic instead of race, and so... Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity there. Um, the same thing for the New York City schools. They are, they have a lot of, of challenges, as as we've seen from headlines in the recent months. But they are, there are a number of community districts there who are trying to address the segregation that's been persisting for decades. And so, so I am hopeful that there are states like that. But you know, I, I do think of the Deep South where I grew up, and in places like that, uh, in which you may not have those same kind of state incentives or state civil rights groups that that had the same input as in New York. And and so how, as a country, do we bring all states along? And I think that's that's the struggle for the next generation. Right. So we're going to end now, as we always do, with our four Mood of the Nation poll questions. So um, thinking about American politics, what makes you angry? What makes me angry at this moment is the number of well-qualified candidates, candidates like Stacey Abrams, who are cheated out of elections because of voter suppression and all other types of, um, you know, efforts to um, remove eligible voters from our roles and to limit who participates in the democratic process. That makes me really angry. What makes me angry is the way in which we're framing a lot of how we talk about our politics in ways that I think only further polarization. And uh, what makes you proud? Being on a college campus every day, one of the things that really makes me proud is to see young people engaged in the political process. When I have students come up to me after class and say, can I pass out voter registration forms? And I say, of course, you know, as long as this is nonpartisan, feel free to engage or or encourage your peers to take part in our, um, you know, political process. So that gives that makes me proud. That makes me excited about the future. That lets me know that we still have young people engaged. We still have young people believing that change is possible and that they have a role to play in our democracy. What makes me proud is thinking about the many individual acts of of courage that have helped make our country live up a little bit more to what we think it aspires to. Uh, And seeing teachers who even you know, the teacher of my three-year-old, teaching them how to stand up and, and be activists for justice. And uh, what makes you worry? Oh, I've seen a lot of disillusionment 
a lot of apathy, a lot of decisions to sit out elections, believing that, um, you know, people's votes don't matter, that people's votes will not count. And that's quite troubling. We know that for a healthy, vibrant democracy, we need an engaged and active and informed electorate. So I'm worried that if we continue to see high levels of disillusionment and high levels of apathy, we will continue to have elections that um, are not made up of the, you know, the majority of, of voters. I worry about the siphoning off of public dollars the way we've been talking about from education. I believe Warren was right that public education is crucial to our democracy. And if we're pulling money away from K-12 schools and higher education, I think we're limiting the ability to robustly prepare our citizens of the future. And then finally, what gives you hope? I must say that the 2018 midterm elections have given me a lot of hope in the sense that we had so many diverse winners. We've got more women serving in Congress than ever before. I believe it was New Mexico that elected the first Democratic Latina governor. We have two Muslim women serving in Congress right now. We saw large numbers of black women elected to Congress, including the first from from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that gives me hope, right? We're seeing that that Americans are coming together and they're responding and they're trying to create a government that's representative of the people in various ways. I hope this doesn't sound not quite so hopeful, but I still got a lot of hope from the election of Barack Obama. I, I, I grew up in a district that really fought desegregation and would have you know, fought a lot of black political power. And, and to see us as a nation elect him is something that still gives me hope. Well, we will leave it there. Of Crystal and Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Thanks. you. So, Michael, I think the the question for us and the question, you know, in terms of this podcast is to look at this issue of um, or the question, I guess, of resegregation in terms of how it implicates democracy. Right. Because it's because the the Warren decision says that um, this needs to happen because it makes our democracy better. At minimum, that's what it claims. It, it almost comes close to saying that without this, de jure segregation is, it undermines democracy, yeah, makes democracy it, worse. I mean, it says that. The constitutional grounds were not that, though. I mean, they, 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 there's nothing constitutional one way or the other about whether or not public schools are going to create good democratic citizens mm-hmm. because, frankly, education isn't even mentioned right. in the federal constitution. True. There are no constitutional protections about education mm-hmm. or any— Even though, which is odd, because so many of the founders were so insistent that without education, without a common education, um, it would be difficult to give you know power to the people, right? Well, but they saw it as a state and local responsibility mm, exactly. exclusively. I mm-hmm. mean, there's simply nothing in the Constitution about it. Right. And, and so the, the, the Warren decision, uh, while they recognize the importance to democracy of, of uh, desegregating schools, you know, it, was, it was made on the basis of the effects on individual students who were in segregated schools or not. And it, it really revolved around that notion of inferiority. Right. If you're going to hold that segregation produces uh, as a result that students are going to feel inferior to those of the other race, then you can't argue that separate is equal. Right. So that that was really. But, yeah, they recognize the importance of this to the democracy as well. And, you know, listening to Erica and Crystal, it's it's obvious that ha- that being in segregated schools is not only bad for students, it's bad for our democracy, right. in large part because of how it's bad for the students. And, and how it's bad for this uh, no, fundamental notion of equality. Right. I mean, yeah. if if you go to a school where um, the facilities are just not only inferior, but are just allowed to. You know. Well, and that is one of the key points, and I was uh, really glad they brought it up. It's that you know, often what follows segregated schools is uh, inadequate funding, inadequate and, fun- and unequal funding, right? And 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 you know, if you're nobody, <laughs> you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure out. You know, you can be a child and still understand 
oh, I don't get this. Somebody doesn't think I don't, I don't deserve this when I know that other, other children in the same community do get it. Yeah, I mean, Crystal made this point quite well about Mississippi, where, where the strategy in the South really was, after they were required to, segregate, to desegregate their schools, was to just say, OK, we're just going to defund <laughs> the public schools mm-hmm. and we're going to create a separate system of private schools to put the white kids in. Right. And we're going to keep the black kids in defunded or underfunded schools. And that was their, that was largely their approach to it. Right. That's, I mean, and that's kind of the most overt way, but even in the most, you know, there's, is there a city where the funding structure of public schools is such that wealthy neighborhoods get a lot of money and poor labor, poor neighborhoods get less money? Well, I, I mean, there have been a series of state court decisions because, uh, you know, the education is within most state constitutions, probably mm-hmm. within all state constitutions. Uh, One way or another. And the guarantee to a equal education is also in many constitutions. And state Supreme Courts have been able to work off of that uh, to argue that there needs to be more more equitable funding between uh, between school districts. And that's where you get into all of these political struggles at the state level to try to equalize spending across school districts. Because local communities, when, they, when, 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 it's, when it's left up to themselves, you know, so poor school districts can tax at enormous rates right. and they just can't get the revenues. Right. Especially because, you know, public schooling in the United States still, ha- you know, it has very strong local roots. And this is, this is part of where a lot of these problems come from. And part of why I wasn't in the Constitution you know, the idea schools were conceived really as something coming up out of the local community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and then states took on the responsibility for it. But, but, it, but it, there's always been this uh, strong belief in uh, American political life that schools are locally controlled and locally funded. Right. And then that's all for the best, right? And that that's the way it should be. I mean, that's the well, argument, the discu- right? Well, except the discussion about segregation today really points to why it's not always Well, Well, exactly, right? You, you know, the fact of the matter is that the that the federal government's sort of pulling out of this business to a large extent. I mean, the the Civil Rights Act has been pretty pretty much undercut, and voting rights, and act the too. Voting Rights Act as well. <laughs> but the but the Civil Rights Act in particular, mm-hmm. and so the the Justice Department does not oversee schools in quite the way that it in quite the way that it used to. Yeah, and that is a that is a perennial um, core political argument, right? Um, that that the the Democrats are push for these federal controls and Republicans uh, fight them, right? I mean, is that fair? Do you, do you agree with that? I mean, No Child Left Behind is maybe a counterexample. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of perennial issue. That's what I mean. The, you know, uh, Republicans tend not to want the federal government to be stronger, and the Democrats do. I right. mean, at a, at a different level, I often think of uh, one way of thinking about the difference, say, between civil rights issues and civil liberties issues is that civil rights issues are about a very strong and powerful government. And civil liberties issues are about protecting people from strong and powerful governments. Mm. And so you can't you can't have civil rights without the government stepping in at some point and telling either other governments or other individual or individuals how they can behave such that they are not discriminating against protected groups. So once a group is recognized as protected, then you need to have the government come in with the strong arm of mm-hmm. the government often to, to basically control the behavior of those who are discriminating. Civil liberties is the opposite, right? Civil liberties is all about the individual protections we have against strong, powerful mm-hmm. governments. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that is not a bad place to wrap this up because that's exactly your point about what happened after Brown versus Board of Education ruling came down. Until the- there was not that infrastructure. Uh, and therefore, it didn't happen, right? Right, and it also points to why the supreme, why the courts were often referred to as the least dangerous branch in American government, because they just they don't really have that much enforcement power of their mm-hmm. own. Mm-hmm. I th- feel like this is just an incredibly complicated issue, and we've only scratched the surface. But you know, welcome to education policy in America, right? It's extremely comp, and not to mention, let's add race to it too, right? So, I mean, it's it's our little foray. Hopefully we'll get back at this and we, we you know, we definitely are grateful to um, to have Erica and Crystal here to, to oh, absolutely. explain it Great to guests. Us. Thanks to Crystal and Erica and for, to Jenna for the interview. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman. And this is Democracy Works. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Penn State. Our hosts are Michael Berkman, Chris Beam, and me, Jenna Spinelli.
Andy Grant is our engineer, and Mark Stitzer is our editor. Additional support comes from Emily Reddy, Shireen Stanford, Craig Johnson, and the rest of the team at WPSU. For detailed show notes and discussion questions for each episode, visit our website at democracyworkspodcast.com. And if you like what you heard today, please consider rating or reviewing us wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.